Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is a reading roundup. In this video I'm going to tell you about some of the books that I've been reading recently. I've got my big cup of tea with me. It is a gloomy, chilly Saturday afternoon. So I've got my sweatshirt on and my big cup of tea so we can get cozy and talk about books. I've got my handy dandy notebook where I keep track of what I've been reading. And let's just get to it. The first book I want to talk about is Robert Morrison's The Regency Years. This is a nonfiction work of history uh, subtitled During Which Jane Austen Writes, Napoleon Fights, Byron Makes Love, and Britain Becomes Modern. Um, Robert Morrison is a Canadian author. Um, he is a Queen's National Scholar at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and a Fellowship of the Royal Society of Canada. And uh, he has written a book focused on the nine years in, uh, in which uh, the prince became regent. So the king, King George, um, had some sort of illness that uh, made it difficult for him to rule, and so the prince became the regent. Um, and for, no, for those nine years, um, a lot of things happened in Britain and uh, he focuses this book on those nine years. It, it was really fascinating. I gave this um, four stars. This came out in 2019. Um, and so uh, he, he really just um, kind of delves into detail in those nine years. He talks about crime, punishment, and the pursuit of freedom, theaters of entertainment, uh, expanding empire, and waging war. Um, and so he really, he really like, uh, he talks about politics and he talks about, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He talks about politics, but he also includes an awful lot of social history. And so what I enjoy here is that he talks about um, the artists and the authors of this time period and what they were writing. And he talks about scientists and what they were um, developing and creating. And he talks about architects and he talks about um, just everything. I really enjoyed the, the detail the, that he chose to go into. And um, his basic premise was kind of, those nine years um, really seem to be uh, a, a cauldron uh, that kind of um, uh, a time where out of that came modern Britain. And uh, um, I'm not explaining myself very well, but um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And so I, I marked a couple of things here to note. He's talking politics here. Um, openly practiced forms of corruption um, as far as uh, politics go. And he's talking about um, landowners who controlled pocket or rotten boroughs in which they bribed or browbeaten often tiny electorate into, support, into supporting their hand-picked candidate, who of course, once he became an MP, felt far more beholden to his patron than to his constituents. The borough of Dunwich on the Suffolk coast was essentially underwater, but that did not prevent it from returning two MPs. Old Sarum near Salisbury had fewer than a dozen voters, but it also returned two MPs. Robert Peel began his political career as MP for the corrupt borough of Cashiel in County Tipperary. For most of the Regency, William Wilberforce was MP for Bramber in Sussex, a borough in the pocket of his wife's cousin, Lord Calthorpe, a wealthy Birmingham evangelical and landowner. And in, 19, in 1819, the economist and stockbroker David Ricardo became the member of, for Port Arlington, where the sheep far outnumbered the roughly 12 electors. Meanwhile, people living in often appalling conditions in rapidly expanding industrial centers such as Birmingham, Manchester, and Leeds had no representation at all. So I find that, I find that very interesting. Um, I also thought it was interesting that he chose to include William Wilberforce here because Will, William Wilberforce, as we, 
I think a lot of us know was instrumental in um, abolishing the slave trade. And so it's an interesting kind of little insight into, um, I think, you know, that people are uh, complicated and uh, not always 100% good and 100% bad. And so, I mean, that was, it was fantastic that he was so heavily involved in abolishing the slave trade, but he also didn't seem to have a problem being part of a corrupt um, political system either. So yeah, I thought that was uh, interesting. And then in his theaters of entertainment um, <clears throat> chapter, he spoke about, um, he's, uh, he's speaking about uh, Jane Austen. Uh, he did a, a big section on Jane Austen, which I thought was really interesting. Um, he's talking about um, Walter Scott uh, and his uh, publication of Waverly, his Waverly stories. And she did not want the competition of Waverly in the same year as she published Mansfield Park. But she too fell under the spell of the so called Wizard of the North. Quote, Walter Scott has no business to write novels, especially good ones, she declared. I do not like him, and I do not mean to like Waverly if I can help it, but fear I must. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty funny. I thought he had good things to say about Jane Austen in here. Uh, and then uh, later on in Expanding Empire and Waging War, He's talking about, he talks a bit about the opium wars. And uh, he said, the drug was an unremarkable part of daily life in the Regency. It was cheaper than beer or gin. It was legal, a very different situation from the restrictions and criminality that we associate with opiates today. And it was available everywhere from chemists and general stores to bakers, grocers, publicans, tailors, street hawkers, market vendors, and country peddlers. That was very interesting, especially his comment. The drug was an unremarkable part of daily life in the Regency. And then finally, in his final chapter uh, called the, the Modern World, he writes, Despite his undisputed failures, the Regent fostered a climate of intellectualism, patronage, and connoisseurship. More than any other member of the royal family, either before or since, he believed that novelists, poets, singers, historians, actors, painters, musicians, scientists, architects, and engineers mattered. And during his regency, his well-known enthusiasm for the arts and the sciences helped to energize the most extraordinary outpouring of creativity in British history. So yeah, it was a, a really interesting read, The Regency Years by Robert Morrison. And then I read uh, Weird Things Customers Say in Bookstores by Jen Campbell, which was hilarious and awesome, and I loved it, and I gave it five stars, and I was continually laughing out loud. Um, it was just, it was really, really funny. And then I read a uh, historical a fiction called The Secret Guests by Benjamin Black. This is, was an interesting, um, <laughs> an interesting story. I gave it four stars. Um, and essentially, in this book, he has the princesses, Margaret and Elizabeth, uh, are sent to Ireland during the Blitz for their protection. And they're there under assumed names. No one is supposed to know who they are. Um, but of course, word gets out. They get uh, sent over with... Um, uh, a, a woman who works for the security services um, to protect them and then um, there's also a guardy um, detective uh, who is there to protect them and uh, yeah it was it was an interesting story uh, just to consider what what may have happened if uh, the princesses were sent to Ireland um, during during the Blitz and uh, yeah I, I liked it it was good I gave it four stars um, and this came out in, yeah, 2020. Uh, and so it's interesting um, because they were sent to, um, what part of Ireland were they in? Um, I forget.
forget I forget where they were. Um, but it's interesting because of course Ireland was neutral um, during the war. Um, but there is of course the history between England and Ireland uh, which added some very interesting uh, plot points <laughs> to this story. So yeah, The Secret Guests by Benjamin Black. And then I read Hum If You Don't Know the Words by Bianca Murray. This is, I call it historical fiction, although I don't know if that technically counts because it's set in the 70s, which isn't necessarily historical, but it feels historical. Um, so it's set in 1970, the late 1970s, I believe, 76, in South Africa. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it was, it was good. I gave it three and a half stars. It came out in 2017. And um, this is told from the perspective of two very different people. One is a girl, a nine-year-old girl called Robin. Her parents are English. Uh, and uh, she, her parents get killed at the beginning of this story. And the other person that we hear from, it's alternating chapters, the other person we hear from is Beauty, who is a, a woman in her early 40s, I, I think, um, who has uh, four, three or four children, and she lives out, um, Robin lives in Johannesburg, but a beauty lives in Trans Key, Transvaal. But her daughter had gone into the city, into Johannesburg, to finish high school. Um, but beauty gets word that her daughter Namsa has gone missing, and so beauty has come into Johannesburg to find her daughter. And so it's alternating chapters between the two perspectives, and these two uh, women meet and. Um, I mean, it's a fantastic story of um, of love and forgiveness and redemption in um, apartheid South Africa, uh, it, where it is, I mean, obviously, like, it's extremely complicated between English and African and um, uh, South African people. Um, and so it's an important story to tell, I think, but I only gave it three and a half stars and that is because of the end. So I'm gonna get super spoilery here because um, I wanna talk about this. So I'm gonna put spoiler across the bottom and uh, if you don't want to know the ending because you haven't read this book yet, then just fast forward until you see me holding up another book or until you don't see the word spoiler across the, the bottom. Um, but I, I wanna talk about this. So she tells this story um, interspersing between, um, between Robin and Beauty. And she has made it abundantly clear in Beauty's chapters that her sole purpose for staying in Johannesburg is to find her daughter and make sure that her daughter is okay and to bring her daughter home. That is the only reason that she is there. Um, and so at the very end of the book, uh, she, she finds out, let's see, her last chapter comes 10 days before the events that end the story. And the last six chapters of the book are all from Robin's perspective. So Robin ends up meeting Namza in a park unexpectedly. Namza knows that she's gonna be there. And Namza gives her a letter uh, to give to her mom and asks her to meet her mother to meet her in the park at a specific date and time. And um, Robin, Robin, um, now this is, I mean, I think this is accurate of a nine-year-old at the time. Robin has lost her parents and she has come to depend upon Beauty and she believes that if Beauty finds Namza, she will go away and leave her. And so, um, Robin does not give the letter or this information to Beauty. And so, but of course Beauty finds out, Beauty finds where um, Robin has hid this letter. And when Robin comes upon her uh, having read this letter, um, before she's able to say anything, uh, Beauty has a heart attack. 
So now Beauty is ending up in is in the hospital, and the last six chapters are all from from Robin's perspective, and Robin is endeavoring to make it right. And so she tracks down Namza and convinces her to come to the hospital, which frankly I found a tad unbelievable how that all played out. Um, but what I did not like was that the only um, scene that the only like the only um, I completely cannot think of the word that I want to use the reconciliation between Namsa and Beauty happens we see it through Robin's eyes from outside the hospital window and that's it and I found that deeply unsatisfying because that was Beauty's whole purpose in this book was to be reunited with her daughter and we don't ever get to see any of that from her own perspective. We see a, a bit of a, a, a reunion but through the hospital window through Robin's eyes and so I was just really disappointed. I didn't think it was a great ending for for beauty and so that's why I gave the book three and a half stars otherwise I did really enjoy it it was a really interesting story um, but I just I did not like how it ended for beauty um, and how we didn't really get to hear from her at the end and then finally I read Christy Town by Susan Candle this is apparently the third or fourth in a series and I have not read any of them. I picked this up at a book sale simply because it was a it was about Agatha Christie. It said it right at the front. And so this is a mystery um, set in the United States in California. Um, but it was about Agatha Christie and so that's what intri intrigued me. A novel about vintage clothing, romance, mystery and Agatha Christie. Uh, but I ended up giving this two stars. I really didn't. Uh, I did really didn't like it. The the characters and the mystery were only okay. They weren't great. The bits about Agatha Christie in here were interesting. They were pretty good. So someone has developed this housing uh, development that is focused on Agatha Christie, and they call it Christie Town, um, which frankly to me sounded horrifying. Uh, I mean, it's on the edge of the desert in California um, and it's all set up to be like uh, to be like 1940s England. It, it just, I thought, who would want to buy a house in, <laughs> in that situation? But anyway, um, and so Cece Caruso is our main character and she's a writer. She's currently working on a biography of Agatha Christie and the guy who is uh, developing this Christie town uh, wants her help there's some kind of opening or something and so she's written a play uh, with Miss Marple and, and everything and the Miss Marple who's supposed to be in her play gets killed and so uh, so it was okay the Agatha Christie stuff in here was interesting and her take on what happened when Agatha Christie disappeared for those 11 days in 1926 was interesting, um, but the mystery itself was only okay. So I gave it two stars and I'm not gonna keep it. I'm gonna pass it along to someone else who might enjoy it more. So that's what I've read recently. Have you read any of these books? I'd love to chat about, um, about it in the comment section down below and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.